morning for our prayer, I'll be reading St. Francis of Assisi's Prayer for Peace, and we also have it up on the screens, so please feel free to, to read along with me as I pray. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. This morning, our speaker is Pastor Daryl Pottiger. Daryl was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He spent six years of early childhood in Zimbabwe, Africa, then returned to the US in 1976 and grew up beside the Roxbury campgrounds just outside of Roxbury, PA. Daryl attended God's Bible College in Cincinnati, Ohio, and graduated with a bachelor's degree related to missions and preaching ministry in 1990. He met his wife, Lisa, while attending college, and they married in the summer of 90 and moved to the Shippensburg area. They raised four children, two boys and two girls, now ranging in age from 18 to 26. Three of them are now married and have provided them with three grandchildren. He initially gave his heart to the Lord at the age of eight, but did not make the commitment stick until he truly surrendered everything to God at the age of 12. God faithfully guided him through his high school years as he grew spiritually and then in college as he prepared for ministry in the church. After graduation, he was the youth pastor and then the senior pastor at Mowersville Brethren in Christ Church, part-time and full-time, totaling 10 years. In 2003, he had the privilege to step out of full-time pastoral ministry and fulfill a dual role working and ministering full-time in the marketplace as a service technician with Marvin windows and doors, but also filling pulpits and assisting churches in transition. Since that time, he has had the honor to fill pulpits across denominational lines and assist in seven church pastoral transmissions. Such as, some as short as a few months, one as long as three years. Daryl's passion is twofold, to live for Jesus in the marketplace and to be used of God to refocus a congregation's attention back on God and his word by making the word come alive through everyday marketplace experiences. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Daryl Pottiger. Thank you. Welcome to the Lord's Day. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? So you heard the introduction, and uh, I don't, you know, a lot of things get through my mind as I hear that and read that. Obviously, the passion that God has laid on my heart. Uh, some things that aren't in there is uh, I'm a little boisterous when I preach. Um, I hope not to scare you. The Lord might get me excited once in a while. Uh, I do get excited about the Word. So my passion is to bring the word alive, which is part of what was in my introduction, to make it real, right? So you can sit and read the word and you can think about it, but unless it becomes real in your life and you can put yourself sometimes in those situations, uh, it just becomes words on a page. So one of my things uh, for me, my passion is that it becomes alive and we live the scriptures. Hence part of the message this morning, take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, 
We'll be reading verses 7 through 14. I use the New King James Version often, so that's what I'll be reading from this morning. I think many of you, I saw the church has in their supply here the New International Version. Um, just letting you know what I'm reading from in case you're using your phone app and want to switch to that, or if you're reading out of the New International Version, you know, very similar wording. The message we want to share with you this morning is called, When God Seems Far, Far Away. And many months ago, I was sitting in my own personal, in my own Sunday school class at my own church, and uh, we were studying the children of Israel and how they uh, were up against the Red Sea, uh, and God was going to do a miracle as they were leaving Egypt, and God had just done the ten plagues. You remember the story for familiar scripture. He had just done the ten plagues, miraculous deliverance. God had showed up on the scene, and they stood there at the water and said, oh, we're going to die. God deserted us, right? But they had just seen miracles that just happened. And I thought to myself sitting in that class, what happened? What went on in their minds? What was the faith crisis? What was the reality of life that they were living in, that they had just seen God work, but then said, oh, we're going to die. God's not going to deliver us now. And so months ago, before the coronavirus and before all the stuff that we're dealing with, before all the riots, before all the political mess that we're dealing with, God gave me a message, brothers and sisters, that just keeps resonating in my heart. It just keeps burning. And the principles that I looked at in the scriptures, I have thought about as I drive down the road, spending many hours on the road, house doing service work with customers and God has brought these truths back time and time again so I trust this morning as you join me in this service that you will hear God speak because brothers and sisters he wants to speak today and he wants to deliver today and we're not stuck where we're at because God has a deliverance for us read with me if you will follow along Exodus chapter 1 starting with verse 7 but the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so, up go, and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built Pharaoh supply cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and brick, in all manner of service in the field, and their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Will you pray with me as we ask the Lord to guide us through this message? Heavenly Fathers, we gather in this sanctuary this morning. We are grateful for the privilege to have the opportunity to gather together. Lord, in this place that has been dedicated and sanctified for the kingdom's use, we once again on this place ask that your presence would meet with us. Father, we don't want just to be a social gathering. We don't want this to be a time where we just kind of did something out of routine. But Father, we want you to show up. And so we ask in the name of Jesus that you would come and meet with us through your word this morning by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would work in our minds and in our hearts and apply this truth. Father, I pray for your servant that I would be able to deliver the message that you've laid on my heart. But Father, I also pray for the people that are listening. That Father, they would be able to hear what your spirit has to say. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to think a little bit about their life here for a moment. Now, I'm going to take you to a very dark place. So stick with me as we go into the dark place because there's several things that I noticed when I looked at the children of Israel and I saw this setting. And first of all, you see, I want you to understand and remember that their life was great. So over here, for however many years it was, and it says in Genesis, the last verse of Genesis, that Joseph saw his family to the third generation. So when you think about that, they were living in ease and comfort. The American dream, in that case it was the Goshen dream, right? Because they were living in Goshen, life was great. They had been spared from famine. Many years had passed. They were loving life, right? Can I get an amen? Life was good. But then all of a sudden, life changed. Now, as I begin to think about that, put yourself in their shoes. You're used to getting up every day and going to your job. You're used to doing the things over here that you're always used to doing. 
They were agricultural people. They went out and took care of their sheep. They took care of their cattle. They farmed the fields. When the rain came, the things grew. Life was great. They'd go home and enjoy their family time, playing games together, whatever they did as a family, right? It was all good. And then one day, when Dad got up to go to work, there's this rap at the door, and you're looking out of bed, and you're wondering what's going on, and here's the Pharaoh army man standing at the door, and he grabs your dad by the back of the neck, or he grabs your, your husband by the back of the collar and jerks him off and says, what's going on? What just happened? You're rubbing sleep out of your eyes. And he drags him off and says, today you are Pharaoh's slave. What? what? Wait a minute. I got cattle to tend. I got fields to plow. No, no, not today. In every family across Goshen, in every family where the, where the Israelites migrated in and populated that area, right? There were a large people. And commentators think that they kind of began infiltrating out into the Egyptian families, right? Into the communities. And every one of them, their life was flipped upside down in a day, right? Simply because the new king said, you know what? I don't like these people. There are too many. How would your life be today? if that happened to you. And I couldn't help but wonder how many prayers went up to God during that time period. Oh God, oh God, can I just go back to the field? Oh God, can I just go back to normal? Oh God, can I just go take care of my cattle? And God didn't answer. The second thing I thought about is, is life went upside down. It wasn't just, hey, you're switching jobs. It wasn't just you're going from agricultural to over here you're going to be a secretary or over here you're going to, you know, just maybe help with Pharaoh's cattle or over here you're going to help do... No, it was a complete change and it was hard labor, right? Did you get that in that verse? It said they made him serve with rigor, harshness, bitterness, right? It, just a hard job wasn't bad enough. They had to make it do it hard and bitter. They hated it, right? How many times do you think that father or that mother or that child prayed, Oh God, please spare my daddy from the hard labor. Look at my daddy's hands, God. They're all bloody. How many times do you think that father came home with aching muscles, sore, and would stumble into the door from being laboring, laboring in brick and mortar all day long? Oh God, God, I can't do this anymore. Can we please go back to normal? didn't answer because every day day after day same kind of labor let me just take a moment to explain how long that was when you study into the scriptures and you think about the time frame from when the king said I don't like these people anymore till chapter 12 when God says you're getting out of Egypt it was anywhere from 80 to 100 years the very least it could be was 80 years because you have Moses and the time frame of Moses' life and so on, right? When he left and went into the wilderness. If you look at the scriptures, you'll see at least 80 years, and it's estimated it was up to 100 years. How long have we been in COVID? A long time, right? Uh, it's only about six months. How about 100 years? just thought I'd share that, right? So year after year, your family's lifestyle flipped up down. It's not comfortable anymore. It's not the Goshen dream anymore. The jobs are hard. They hated going to work. I can only imagine. And then let's look at verse 22 of chapter 1. So Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, notice all his people saying, Every son who is born to you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Now think about this, brothers and sisters. They probably made friendships with the Egyptian people, right? We're normal people. I mean, think about it. They weren't, they weren't like just outcast or off. No, they, they made friendships with their neighbors, I'm pretty sure. And all of a sudden, you notice that that neighbor Egyptian is kind of like, snooping around, kind of asking strange questions. Oh, by the way, so I have three grandchildren. I have a fourth on the way. Woo! Praise God, hallelujah, right? I'm excited about that. I'm a happy pappy, right? Uh, yeah, think about it. If I was living in Egypt, 
I'd have to keep that a secret because I don't know whether that baby's coming is going to be a male or female. They didn't have all the sonograms and stuff back then, right? So they couldn't find out. And you see this neighbor Egyptian, like my neighbor next door, kind of looking over the fence. Listen to the conversations. I'd have to whisper to my wife, say, hey, Aaron and Brandon are having a baby. Better not tell anybody. Because if somebody finds out, they're going to be snooping around their house. Think about it. Think about the mistrust. Think about the hiding they had to do, right? How many times do you think it was found out and a baby was drowned? Did you ever think of that? You see, Pharaoh made a command, and every child that was a male was to be drowned in the river. We only have one story of deliverance. What about in those hundred years, how many baby boys were born and yanked out of the mother's arms? Can you imagine the pain, ladies? You have that baby boy and you're trying to hide it. Hush, hush, my child. And in comes the guard. In comes the neighbor that ratted on you and grabs that baby out of the cribs, grabs that baby out of your heart. No, not my baby. No, not my baby. Right? And how many times that baby, and you watch that baby thrown in the river and thrown into the water. How would your faith be then? You see, when I started thinking about those things, I realized that when the children of Israel stood at that river, they had seen many times when God seemed far, far away. And if you continue reading on through chapter 4 and chapter 5, you see that things didn't get better. God, please deliver us. God, please give me a regular job back. God, please spare my child. God, why are they making us get straw now? We have to get straw now. The, 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 the labor's got worse. I thought you were showing up. I thought you sent a deliverer. And brothers and sisters, can I remind you that in those cases and in circumstances in your life, God seems far, far away. Are, are you hanging in with me? How many times have you prayed for somebody to be delivered from cancer and they died? How many times, brothers and sisters, have you prayed for a marriage to be restored and it wasn't restored? How many times have you prayed for God to intervene in your job and it didn't seem like he intervened? How many times have we prayed, oh God, take this COVID away from us, but it's still here? Can I challenge you this morning that it's tough it's tough to keep your focus in the right place. Amen? As I began just putting myself in their shoes, maybe even possibly having a crisis of, of faith in my own life, saying, God, what are you doing? I started going back through the scriptures, and I said, God, where have you showed up in the past? Now stick with me, follow with me, because I want to show you real quick where God showed up. So if you flip back to chapter 1 again, and start thinking about where God showed up, I noticed that maybe their struggle wasn't so much that God wasn't showing up, it's that they were missing when God was showing up, <laughs> right? So if you look at chapter 1, one of the first things I saw was in verse, uh, what is it, verse 12, it says, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Now, I don't know about you, and, and you folks are older, an older congregation here, so I don't think I'll offend anybody, but folks, when you're weary and tired, it doesn't normally happen in the bedroom too often, right? Commentators say that that's part of what Pharaoh was trying to do and make them so weary that they couldn't have children, <laughs> right? Whether it was for the fact that they were too tired to actually have, have lovemaking or whether they were too tired and the, and the birth process just didn't happen, right? The things didn't work the way the natural normally works. But you know what? God intervened. And I don't know how he did it, but the more they got afflicted, the more they had babies. Woohoo! Glory, hallelujah, right? <laughs> that was one way to grow the church. Just 
get tired and weary and have babies, right? God intervened. God showed up. The next thing I noticed, look at verse uh, 17. We didn't, we didn't read all that, but in verse 17, notice there were at least two midwives, and there's understanding whether those two midwives were over top of other midwives. But either way, these were the chief midwives. And Pharaoh said, you are to kill all the baby boys. And they said, mm, you know what? You think you're all that, Mr. Pharaoh, but we serve God, and we're not doing it. And they said, when Pharaoh said, what? why aren't you doing what I told you to do? They said, they're having kids too quick. I mean, boom, they're just like, oh, man, the baby's coming. Oh, the baby's here. Wouldn't you ladies that had kids wish it happened that quick, right? My wife, when we had our first child, uh, she actually had to have a C-section because my boy did not want to come out, <laughs> right? And she was induced in the morning like at 7 a.m. By 8 o'clock, she was only dilated one centimeter. That's a problem, Right? And they said, you know what? It's time for this kid to come out. Well, they didn't have surgical procedures back then. They didn't need them. They didn't need procedures back then because before the midwives could get there, the kid was born. You think God wasn't intervening? Woo! Praise God. Hallelujah. Some of the easiest births ever in history. Amen? Notice God showed up. The other thing I noticed, there was in verse 2 or chapter 2, the classic story of Moses being saved. We love that story, right? Anybody love that story? It's great. God showed up. I think it's hilarious. Who saved Ma Moses? Who was it? Pharaoh's own daughter. <laughs> I get excited about stuff like that. God has an awesome sense of humor, doesn't he? Pharaoh thinks he's all this powerful, like, next to God. God says, you know what? Your own daughter is going to save the male that's going to deliver these people. And by the way, you're paying for it. <laughs> and oh, I'm going to have the mother be the babysitter, and you're going to pay her too. That's awesome. God showed up, right? I don't know if they forgot that. <laughs> but think about it. God's showing up. In uh, chapter 3, God even though Moses was taking things in his own hand, God used that mistake to turn it around for his glory. Do you know God's in the mistake-changing business? Can I get an amen? Right? Moses took things in his own hands, and God said, All right, we're going to send you to the desert for 40 years, and while you're in the desert for 40 years, you're going to be learning the land. Because guess what? In another couple years, you're going to be going out there, and you're going to be leading the people out. Glory, hallelujah! <laughs> God was working even though the people didn't realize it, right? They heard it in the news as Moses murders the taskmaster. I don't know what the headline might have been. God had it as, I've got a plan. You're going to map the land. Amen? Right? You continue on through the chapters where God shows up having signs and wonders through Moses and bringing him back and saying, you're going to be delivered, and you keep following that through. Brothers and sisters, can I challenge us that when we're in those moments of darkness, God is showing up, and if we are focused on the problem and not on God, we will miss the God sightings. Hello? Because I can promise you, God is working. That doesn't mean we str don't struggle. That doesn't mean that we you know, get blurred vision. But it means we have a decision to make. When God shows up and he continues to show up, we have a choice. We either put our faith in action. We believe what we've heard and read in the word of God. And we put our faith in action and move forward in faith. Or we begin to doubt. We begin to disbelieve. And then we become disobedient. Amen? We have a choice every single time. So here's what I'd like to leave with you, with you this morning. Because every one of us, I can promise you, as you're walking this Christian journey, I can promise you every one of us will have a moment, a crisis of faith. Probably even right now, right? If you listen to the news, you listen to the headlines... It's all skewed, right, in various ways. Or it can skew your thinking. Even if it's a true event and a true happening, Moses did kill somebody, but God turned it around. 
So we can get focused on the headlines, we can focus on the problem, we can focus on the darkness, or we can make a choice. Five things that I thought of as I searched this out and allowed God to just breathe his life into my crisis of faith. Number one, and I encourage you, I encourage you to write this down. Put it in your phone, put it in a piece of paper, put it in the back leaf of your Bible. The reason I say that is because time and time again, since the Lord has given me this message, as I said, I'll be driving down the road and asking God, God, what are you doing? And he begins bringing these things to my mind, right? Important pillars that we need to keep in 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 mind. Number one, consistency. Consistency. We need to stay consistent in our prayer life. It may not feel like God is answering. It may not feel like your prayer is getting higher than your bedroom ceiling or your basement ceiling or your prayer closet ceiling. Or if you come in here and pray, you have a little further ceiling, right? Maybe some that's good to come in here. It, sometimes it doesn't seem like our prayers get any higher than that, right? Sometimes it doesn't seem like when you're reading the word that it's really coming alive. It's just words on a page. Sometimes your conversations of faith seem dead. But brothers and sisters, can I plead with you that we have to stay consistent even when we don't feel like it. Amen? I liken it to a person who works on uh, telephone poles and electric lines. There are some days, brothers and sisters, that it feels like all you're doing is digging holes. Dig a hole, dig a hole, dig a hole. When you look around and see how many electric poles and telephone poles, how many holes had to be dug? And some days it just seems like all you're doing is putting poles in the ground, pole in the ground, pole in the ground, pole in the ground. And some days all you're doing is just stringing lines. I'm so tired of stringing lines. Line after line. When you think of the thousands of miles of line, telephone line, electric line. But brothers and sisters, one day the power is turned on. And I can guarantee you when it comes to that electric line, if you grabbed a hold of that, you'd get a major jolt in life. Amen? And brothers and sisters, sometimes that consistency is so necessary because God will answer and the jolt will come. <laughs> Woo! Glory! Hallelujah! Praise God! <laughs> I love it when God shows up. Amen. And I need Him to show up. But I have to be consistent. I have to be in the place of prayer. I have to be in His Word. I have to be in the place of worship. Amen? Number two. Contentment. We have to be willing to accept what God is doing right now. But God, I don't like it. But God, I want comfortableness. But God, I want my regular job back. God, I just want just normalcy, just things to be normal. Are we willing to be content in what God is doing, when he's doing it, and how he's doing it? We have to ask ourselves that question, right? Because I see in the scriptures that there was a guy named Paul. You remember him? The Apostle Paul. And he pled with God and pleaded with God, God, please take this infirmity away from me. And God said, mm -mm, not today. My grace is sufficient. But God, my grace is sufficient. Jesus himself, when he was going to the cross, can you imagine? That's really tough to think about the agony he was going to face and the emotional trauma that was weighing upon him. He said, God, not my will, but your will, right? Contentment. The third thing is contemplation. Contemplate, remember, reflect. You see, as I thought back about the children of Israel, I wonder how many times they took time to think about where God showed up in the past. So there they stand in the crisis moment at the river. Surely, surely somebody could have thought a day earlier, God just showed up. I bet he'll show up today. Or months before, when God did miracles and kept doing the plagues and it didn't fall on them, it was only falling on the Egyptians. 
But see, what happens is we find ourselves in the cloud, we find ourselves in the dark, we find ourselves there, and we don't, we don't stop. We just get frenzies. We get, oh my goodness, what? And we don't stop and reflect on what God has done in our lives in the past. I wished one of these services I would have a lot of time and we could just take time across the whole congregation to tell people, God showed up here. God showed up here. God did this here. God did this here, right? Thinking about where God showed up. You don't always have that opportunity. We've had a lot of alone time, right, and all this separation and everything else. Are we taking time to think about where God has shown up? Number four, conversation. We need to tell other people about it, right? We need to tell other people where God is showing up, where you're having God sighting. Amen? So I can't help but wonder how often Miriam told the story, right? Think about that story. She stood there on the bank and watched Pharaoh's daughter grab that baby, and I can't imagine the fear that she felt. She's going to drown my brother. But instead, she lifts up the baby and a smile comes up. Can you imagine Miriam watching that happen? And then she had the privilege to go and run to her mother and say, Mom, you get to be the babysitter. Miriam was still alive when they're standing at the water. I wonder how many times she told the story. Maybe she failed. I don't know. Maybe she failed to remind her people God showed up those many years ago. God can show up now. So, brothers and sisters, the challenge in my own life is how many times am I telling people, am I being willing to even tell my unsaved coworkers, being willing to tell the homeowners that I meet when I'm working on their doors and windows and they begin sharing life stories, God showed up here. God can do this here. God can do this here, right? Brothers and sisters, I would not be standing on this stage today if God hadn't showed up when I was a little kid in Africa. Because a little kid in Africa, I was up on one of our big water tanks where they collected water for the rain. And that's how we got our water. We didn't have wells. You had to collect your water. And my brother and I were up on top, and we had flown an airplane, one of those little play planes, and it went up on top there. And we climbed up on top, and I stepped on an old board and almost fell in this large tank. But God spared my life, right? How many times have I told that story? Not enough. Right? But it came back to mind as I was studying this. Because God showed up in my life. Hallelujah. Woohoo! Right? How many times do you tell people? Conversations. And you know, we defeat the darkness of Satan, it says in Revelation, by the blood of the Lamb. You gotta know Jesus. Amen? You gotta know Jesus. And by the word of our testimony. Amen? It defeats Satan. Finally, number five. We need to pray together collectively. So congregation is the word. Congregate. Praise God that we could actually get back together in worship again. Now I know there's nervousness and I know there's precautions, but it is just not the same as sitting in front of your TV or computer screen or phone and seeing other people in Zoom meetings or Zoom church or YouTube services, right? When you have a chance even though we have to be separated, to be together collectively. Amen? Right? There's something significant about how we are developed and built by God that we need to be in congregation. Amen? And so the challenge is when life hits us hard, people most often withdraw from that congregation. And can I encourage you, brothers and sisters, don't withdraw. Instead, be intentional. Pick up the phone and call your brother and sister and say, I need help. Intentionally get out of bed when you don't feel like it and come to the place of worship. Because brothers and sisters, God has ordained it that in this place, His hallowed presence comes. Amen? And in the collection of the congregation of believers, He says, I will be there. I will meet with you. Hallelujah. I am so grateful for my brothers and sisters. The opportunity to fellowship together. So we pray together. We meet together. We worship around the word together. We sing together.
God is in the delivering business. And the challenge we're facing right now, I had no idea when this message came together, when God gave me this message, it was before COVID. But it's just continued to resonate because this is where we're living, right? We are the children of Israel, so to speak, with our lives kind of turned upside down. I have no idea where our nation is going necessarily, but I know I have a God who knows. And I know a God who will take care of me. And a God who is stronger than any president that this United States has because he's been stronger than any king or pharaoh or ruler all of the centuries before. Amen? That doesn't mean life is going to be easy. That doesn't mean we ignore things. It doesn't mean when we're sharing that it's not real, but it means we keep our focus on God. Amen? Let me pray with you. Father, I pray that you would sanctify your word. I pray that this would be an encouragement to each of us in this gathering this morning to walk faithfully before you. I thank you for the privilege of being here in your presence today. We worship you now as we lift our voices in song. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.